Okay, welcome to the first class. This is the first uh, real class. The last one was more an introduction of what kinds of methods are around or what, what can be done nowadays. This is more the basics, what I'll show you today. And uh, the issue is I'm starting with uh, a, a chapter that is actually rather dry at a first glance. You may have looked at the slides already. It's a bit technical, it's a bit dry. The way we tackle the 3D reconstruction problem is by methods of linear algebra. And so I decided this uh, class is building up on a book of Ma, Soato, uh, Koseka and Sastri that I mentioned last time. And so I decided uh, to, uh, they use a lot of linear algebra and I decided to present a kind of short summary of the key uh, concepts beforehand. That way, once we have the different techniques, you will know what a matrix is, what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, and ideally also what the singular value decomposition is. So the chapter we have today is about it, like a, a, a short review of linear algebra. I assume that all of you have had linear algebra at some point, but you may not remember a everything. And so I decided to just give you a, a short crash course of, of the key concepts so that we're all on the same page. Again, if you have questions anytime, feel free to interrupt me. So there are three parts in this chapter. Uh, the first part is on vector spaces. What are vector spaces? How are they defined? Uh, what are properties of vector spaces? Then linear transformations and matrices, kind of the key uh, concepts behind linear algebra. And then more specifically, what kinds of properties of, of, of matrices we have. And, and, and then ultimately, there will be the last part is the singular value decomposition. A vector space is a, a set, V we will call it, a linear space or a vector space over a field R. It's called a vector space if it is closed under summation, so you have elements in that space V and you can co combine them, you can sum them and get a new vector. And in addition, you have another a way to combine them and that is uh, w with real numbers and uh, or uh, numbers from from the field the underlying field here we will assume it's r and this is called the scalar multiplication so you just take a vector let's say small v and you scale it with a scalar alpha <coughs> and so <coughs> the whole thing is that you can do uh, summation and uh, scalar multiplication and you always remain in that vector space so for any V1, V2 and any scalars alpha and beta, alpha V1 and B plus beta V2 is still an element in that vector space. And so you can sum vectors and scale them, etc. And in addition, you, you, we require that uh, with respect to the summation, uh, the structure forms a commutative group. So you, you can commute the elements, uh, so V1 plus V2 is the same as V2 plus V1. In addition, you have a, a, you, uh, the group means that you have a neutral element, a zero element that must be part of the, vector sp uh, uh, of the vector space, and you have an inverse element. So for any vector, you also have the negative. The scalar multiplication uh, has to respect the structure of the underlying field, here the real numbers, which means that if I first scale a vector u by beta and then by alpha, is the same as multiplying alpha and beta in, in R and then scaling the vector with alpha times beta. A lot of this stuff is clearly very intuitive. If you think of, of a vector space as R3, for example, you know, the, the, the three-dimensional Euclidean space that we live in, then all of these properties evidently hold. But still it's useful to make these properties explicit, that you, you have an understanding of uh, that this is not necessarily always the case for any kind of structure, but here we want it to be the case. Multiplication and addition respect the distributive law, so basically this means whether I first do summations in the, in, in the field 
uh, r and then scale the vector or first scale the vector with alpha and beta and then do the summation in the vector space comes out to the same. So in some sense the structures are consistent. And similarly, alpha times V plus U should be alpha V plus alpha U. And in fact, once you do calculus in vector spaces, you always use these properties. But the key is that we, you know, the whole requirement of vector space is the assumption that they, they hold. And the standard, in fact, the vector space that we will consider mostly in this, in this class is Rn, in particular R3, of course. So that is vectors that have, you know, three components. <coughs> in addition to a vector space, you can define a so-called subspace, that is a subset of these vectors. But what's critical is the subspace has to be a vector space as well. In particular, that means the zero element has to be in the set, in that subset. And in addition, it means it has to be closed. So if I do summation in the subspace, I have to remain in the subspace. What I find helpful for all of these mathematical structures is that for every structure you have in, in linear algebra, you get tons of structures, you get vector spaces, you get groups, you get modules and whatnot. What I find helpful to keep the structures apart is to always have one example in mind. So for a vector space, the example would be R3. And for a subspace, for example, any plane that goes through the origin is a subspace. If it doesn't go through the origin, then it's not a subspace, because then you have no zero element. So any plane or any line that goes through the, uh, through the origin is, is then a one-dimensional subspace or a two-dimensional subspace. In addition, you remember from linear algebra, there is the concept of a basis, and it starts with the notion of linear independence. Once we have a set of vectors, let's call it S, V1 through Vk, a set of vectors from that subspace, uh, we can talk about a spanned uh, subspace. So these are vectors. This subspace they span is all linear combination of these vectors. So, for example, any plane going through the origin, I said, uh, is a subspace of R3. And then you can typically find two orthogonal vectors that define, uh, the, uh, that span this space. So, any point in that space can be reached by just taking a weighted sum of these vectors. And this is called the span, is all the vectors that you can reach by weighted sums of these individual vectors. In addition, you want, in practice, you want a representation of that subspace that is in some sense minimal. Of course, you can reach every vector in that space by concatenating arbitrarily many vectors, but really you want a minimal representation. And so, for example, a two-dimensional subspace should be representable with two vectors only. And the question is <coughs> whether, and, and so basically once you have a set of vectors, you can look at each individual vector and say how much additional sort of information does this vector provide. And to denote that, you can talk about linearly independent sets. A set S is called linearly independent, and here the way you typically introduce linear independence is in this way, you say if a linear combination of these vectors is zero, then it follows that all, all coefficients must be zero. If that is true for any possible linear combination that gives zero, then the set is linearly independent. In practice, that is not terribly intuitive. That was always my problem in math classes, that they, they give you definitions of things, but they don't, they don't really get an intuitive notion. The way you can make this more intuitive is assume they are not linearly independent. That means I have some linear combination alpha i v i, which is zero, i equals one through k. We had k here. And then let's say, and alpha j is not zero. So let's say we have some linear combination where one of the coefficients is not zero. 
then what we can deduce right away is that Vj is 1 over alpha j uh, with a minus uh, i equals 1 through k i not equal j alpha i. What that means is as soon as one of the coefficients is non-zero, I can take that term to the other side and solve for Vj because I can divide by alpha j. And that means I can, sorry, I can represent the vector Vj as a linear combination of the remaining vectors. And in terms of constructing the subspace, that vector is redundant. I don't need it. I can represent it by all the others. And so a set is linearly dependent if, if it's in some sense redundant. If there are vectors in there that you can just as well skip because you can represent them with the others. And so you see that this definition is actually says nothing but that there is no redundancy in these vectors, that each vector contributes something new. <coughs> And so, in other words, this more abstract notation, formulation of in linearly independent uh, vectors, uh, it just means that uh, none of the uh, vectors can be represented by the remaining as a linear combination. If, if this doesn't hold, they, they are called, of course, linearly dependent. And now we come to the notion of a basis. A set of vectors v1 through vn is called the basis of that vector space if first of all it is linearly independent, the set, and secondly it spans the entire space. I can represent each vector as a linear combination. And so a basis is a maximal set of linearly independent vectors. And in fact, the way you can easily construct the basis is that you start by one vector that is in that in in your uh, space, and then you iteratively add vectors while they are still linearly independent to the current set of vectors. <coughs> And as soon as you can no longer add a vector that is linearly independent of the others, then you have all vectors. <coughs> bases have, uh, and in fact, once you construct the bases, you find, especially if you construct it in this manner, you find that there are essentially in in infinitely many possible bases for, for R3 or for R2. And basically I can choose the coordinate axis this way, this way, this way, but I can also choose them in, in any, any other way. And so you have infinitely many bases uh, or, or a large number of possible bases for any space. Uh, let's assume we have two bases, B and B prime, uh, are two sets of vectors then you can show that B and B prime contain the same number of vectors and this number n, the number of vectors in these bases, is called the dimension of that space V. So for example, R3 is a three-dimensional space because you can span it with three linearly independent vectors. In addition, any Vector V can be uniquely expressed as a linear combination of these basis vectors. And that is useful, so having a minimal set of spanning vectors as you have in the basis allows you to have a unique representation of each element. It would be not so nice to have a, you know, multiple representations for the same element. There are spaces where you have that. For example, if you label, you'll see later if you talk about rotations, you know that if I rotate 360 degrees or I rotate zero degrees is the same. So, for example, the representation of rotations by angles is not unique, unless I constrain the rotation angle and say it has to be in the interval between zero and smaller than. Uh, 360. But if I don't constrain that, then I have an overcomplete complete I have a representation of where a single element is represented multiple times. And that's usually not a good thing if you have that. Sometimes it can't be avoided, but here in the representation of vector spaces, we can avoid it. <coughs> 
I'm not going to prove these properties, but the proofs are actually not so difficult. Here, for example, most of these are proved by contradiction. You say, assume there are two different representations of the vector, then you con construct a contradiction to the fact that they're linearly independent. So if I have two representations, alpha i, b i, uh, and the same, say, beta i, b i, and, the, and they both represent v, so they're the same, then their difference is zero, and then the coefficients must be zero because of the linear independence. So I'm, as I said, I'm not going to prove these properties. If you're interested in the proofs, you can just go back to any book on linear algebra. Here, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of review the main results. In particular, I said every vector is, can be uniquely represented. What you can do is you can represent the vectors of the bases b prime, these vectors b i prime, you can represent them as linear combinations of the other basis vectors. So you can represent one set of basis vectors as linear combinations of the other set of basis vectors. And if you do that for all basis vectors, these are called the basis transformations, these coefficients these uh, of the linear combination, alpha, j, i, let's call them. These are the coefficients that form a matrix. And that matrix is called the basis transformation. It allows me to go from one basis to the other. That's useful because, let's say, in, in reconstruction of the world, we always want to reconstruct the world, and the question is, in what representation do we reconstruct the world? And it turns out there is no unique ideal representation. So if you do reconstruction from a moving camera, for example, then the camera moves, so you, cannot you can always reconstruct in the coordinates of the camera frame, but if the camera changes over time, you constantly change the basis representation. And so sometimes you want to go back to some world reference coordinate frame that is fixed in the world, that doesn't depend on your moving camera. And so in practice, it turns out you do have to sometimes do basis transformations to go from the current coordinate frame of my moving camera to some world reference frame. And you can do that, you can write it compactly, you can either write it for the individual vectors as linear combinations like this, or if you want to do it simultaneously for all vectors, then you can say B prime is B times A. And that matrix A is invertible, so you can also, of course, write the matrix B as a, a linear combination of the B prime vectors. And so uh, the matrix A does the uh, transformation from one basis to the other, and A minus 1 does the inverse. <coughs> In addition to the scalar product, one can define a so-called inner product, or sometimes called dot product. Unfortunately, the terminology is slightly confusing here. You, in German, for example, this is called the Scalar product, the dot product, but it's not the same as the scalar multiplication, scalar multiplication. So one is where I multiply a vector by an element from, from the underlying field, by a real number. And here, what we mean by the inner product or dot product is a product of two vectors. So it takes two vectors and multiplies them. So, for example, to give you a concrete example in R2, V1, V2 times W1, W2, what I do is V1 times W1 plus V2 times W2. And so that is some element out of R. Uh, of R. So that is a, a scalar product. In inner product. This inner product has three properties. First of all, it is linear, so if I multiply a vector u with alpha v plus beta w, then it is consistent with, with that uh, scalar multiplication, so I have alpha u times v plus beta u times w. 
the other property that I that the scalar product the inner product has to uh, fulfill is it has to be symmetric so u times v is the same as v times u for this for example that that is the case and then it has to be positive definite which means if I multiply a vector with itself v times v this has to be non-negative meaning zero or larger than zero and in fact in addition if it is zero that is only true for the zero vector so these are the three properties. If they hold, then your product is called an inner product or a dot product. Once you have a scalar product, it induces a norm. Basically, for any vector, you can multiply that vector with itself. And since this is a non-negative number, you can take the square root and you get some non-negative number. And that number that you get is called the lengths of the vector v. And once you have a norm, you can define a metric. That means for any two vectors, I can define something like a distance between the two vectors. And uh, that would be the norm of, for two vectors v and w, of their difference. You know, this often seems very obvious and clear to people. Uh, for example, for points in R3 that I can represent as vectors, you all know the distance is the length of the line between connecting the two points. But what you may also know is that in terms of metrics, there's actually an infinite number of possible metrics. And that distance of the line connecting them is just one metric. And even for points, I can define other metrics. For example, there is something in image analysis that's called the Manhattan metric. Once I have a grid, I can say the distance from that point to that point is the distance on that re uh, rectangular grid. And now you know why it's called Manhattan metric, because that's, that's how long you walk in Manhattan. You can't go diagonal, and so you have to go along. So even if you have roads, you can maybe go, if there's multiple blocks here, you can go like that, but the distance is, is the same. And so it's not going to be the Euclidean distance, but it's the so-called Manhattan metric. And so there are many metrics, and actually the, the study of metrics is a very fascinating topic in itself. For points in Rn, this is not so fascinating, but let's say you have many other problems. Let's say you have three-dimensional shapes, and then you want to compute a distance between two shapes. Then it becomes actually a very challenging and, to date, somewhat open research problem. How to measure, how to define, and how to compute metrics between more complex structures. So here is a metric, and in this case, the metric, as you can see, is induced by the scalar product. In a vector space, where the, once you have a metric, you can measure lengths, you can measure distances, and then it's called a metric space. And in particular, if this metric, as shown here, is induced by the scalar product in this manner, then it's called a Hilbert space. So a Hilbert space is nothing but a metric space where the metric is induced by the scalar product. In general, metrics don't have to be induced by scalar products. You know, if I have a set of elements, I can just, you know, construct a chart uh, uh, that tells me what is the distance from any vector A to any vector B. And as long as, you know, as long as these are non-negative numbers uh, and fulfill certain properties, this is a metric. So metrics don't have to be induced by the scalar product, but if they are, then we talk about the Hilbert space. In addition, we have, I was talking about inner products, there is a so-called canonical inner product, and that's exactly the one I wrote here. So for Rn, we can define the inner product of two elements, x and y, as just the sum over xi times yi. That is the canonical inner product for Rn. And the norm that this scalar 
this inner product induces is called the Euclidean norm. So that is exactly what I mentioned earlier, the distance of the, the, the lengths between the connecting, of the connecting line. Once we have a basis transform A from uh, to a new basis B prime, uh, um, and it's given by the identity uh, uh, B prime times A. Identity means that is the standard uh, 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 basis. Here I n is maybe I should write that in case you don't know what I mean by I n. So I n is a is just a unit matrix, and that means. Uh, just vectors that that is the uh, the canonical basis one zero 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 one zero etc and then I can transform to any other by basis b prime with a basis transform a then we can see what the canonical inner product looks like in the new coordinates x prime y prime so x prime y prime are the coordinates with respect to the basis b prime and we see that if i multiply x times y the canonical inner product you can also write x transposed y then i can represent uh, x in the coordinates of uh, x prime of the new basis so that would be a times x prime and a times y prime for y and once I multiply that out, I get x prime transposed, a transposed a, and y prime. And sometimes this is written as the scalar product of x prime, y prime, with respect to the matrix a transpose a. So that is a notation that I can, excuse me, that I can say scalar product of say A and B with respect to some matrix, let's call it M here, it means A transposed M B. So that's a shorthand notation and this is called the induced inner product from the matrix A. And so once I have the canonical product, I can easily convert it into any other uh, 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 product uh, with respect to some other basis. I call two vectors V and W, we call them orthogonal if their scalar product is zero. That's a useful property, you know what orthogonal in practice it means that uh, you know the vectors are 90 degree. Then their scalar product is zero. Um, so we see a basis doesn't actually have to be orthogon orthogonal, but we will see in a second that having orthogonality is useful. In addition to the summation on the vector space, the scalar multiplication and the scalar product, we can also do products of matrices. And I wanted to mention that here because they are used frequently in what comes later. Uh, the product is called Kronecker product. Who has not heard of Kronecker products before? Okay, good. So this is actually useful that I mentioned that. It's very trivial. There's nothing deep behind the Kronecker product. Let's say you have two matrices A and B, and the coefficients of the matrix A are going to be called A11 through AMN. So they don't have to be square matrix, any rectangular matrix. Then what I can easily do is I can multiply the matrix B by A11 and by all the coefficients of A, and then put that into some generally very large matrix. And so if A is M by N and B is K by L, you can easily see that the overall matrix I get here is M times K times NL. So MK times NL, so it's, it's you know, it, it's fairly large. But this is a way to co combine matrices, to do products of matrices. Why you would want to do that is beside the point right now. We will see that later on. It turns out useful to have such a, a way to combine matrices. And MATLAB is going to be the software that we do the exercises in. And here, uh, 
the Kronecker product in MATLAB can be written as cron of A and B. One reason why we do the exercises in MATLAB is that there are a lot of functions like this inbuilt already. So you don't have to program that stuff. I'm sure all of you could program that. It's a for loop, you know, it's not difficult, but it saves a lot of time to work in a language that has all of this inbuilt. So cron AB does the Kronika product and generates that very large matrix. In addition, there are other things you may want to do in MATLAB with matrices. Let's say you have an M by N matrix, a lot of columns, and you want to make it into a vector. What you can do is you can take the columns and just concatenate them as a long vector. So the first column, then below that the second column, third column, etc. And this is called stacking. So you stack the columns of the matrix into one huge vector. And uh, this is called the stacking. And uh, so that's so you can rewrite if A1 through AN are these columns, then you get uh, AS, A stacked, is, is, a, is the same. Basically, you still have the same elements, but they're all in a vector. And we'll see a bit later that this is often useful to you know, rearrange the elements of a matrix in this way. What's important though is this is really nothing profound, you know, it's just we rearrange the elements. And why that is useful, we'll see later. But one thing you can see already is this expression is called a bilinear form, a vector U transpose times a matrix A times a vector V. We can rewrite that with the Kronecker product and the stack operation as V Kronecker U transposed A stacked. And so this is useful because it shows you, for example, that this expression is actually linear in the elements of A. I mean, if you look at it, you know it's linear, but here it's kind of more explicit. It's, a, it's just a product of two, a scale up, a multi, a inner product of two vectors. And so we will use these and other properties later on. So the whole point of this class, as I mentioned, is to introduce the basics and I think it's going to be useful later in the class if you ever need any of these basics, you can always go back to the slides of the first chapter and look, look things up. Linear transformations. This is an interesting uh, uh, domain uh, in, in science in general, is the study of linear transformations. Um, and you've seen that, I mean, starting even in, in high school, solving linear equation systems, things like that are, are central elements of uh, uh, here. A transformation from a vector space V to some other vector space W is called linear if it is consistent with the summation, meaning if the transformation applied to a sum of vectors is the same as the sum of the transformed vectors. And in addition, it commutes with the scalar multiplication in the sense that if I transform a scaled vector, it's the same as scaling the transformed vector. If these two properties hold, then the transformation L is called linear. And it turns out that these two properties are extremely useful in the whole notion of linearity because it means that the action of that operation L on any vector space V can be characterized completely by saying what does it do to the basis vectors. Why? Because any vector can be represented as linear combination of the basis vectors. And if I know what L does to the basis vectors, then I just have to do the linear combination of the transformed basis vectors. And so for linear transformations, they are completely characterized by stating what does L do to each basis vector. Let's say we take the canonical basis, E1 through En. 
uh, then L of any, and, and let's say A are the transforms of E1 and En, so L of E1 through L of En, then um, for any vector x, um, L of x is A times x, where x are the coefficients in that basis. And basically what we get here is a matrix, an M by N matrix that characterizes the operation of a linear operator L. What that means is if we look at linear transformations of some space, it means we can just as well look at matrices, M by N matrices. Because any linear transformation corresponds in this way to a matrix. And in turn, any matrix, M by N matrix, corresponds to a linear transformation. Meaning, we have introduced linearity with these two properties, but actually, studying linear transformations is nothing but studying matrices, because they're one and the same. And so, in, and this is why we study matrices, uh, uh, and this is why this class also is going to uh, focus on properties of matrices. And uh, the idea uh, is that we can, we can in this way represent any kind of linear transformation. So some notation here: real M by N matrices. We are call, we are going to call M of M and N that are matrices M by N matrices with real numbers. If M equals N, they're square matrices. Then we call this space M of N. These square matrices form a ring over the field R. What that means, so we have another term from linear algebra, we had groups already, we had vector spaces, subspaces, now we get the concept of a ring. Uh, you can look it up if you like, but the key is that uh, they form a ring because they're closed under matrix multiplication and summation. So we s said earlier, if you have a vector space, you can do uh, an inner product of two vectors, so you can multiply two vectors, but you get a real number. You don't get a vector. And what you would like is a space, a vector space V, where you can combine two vectors, not just summation, but multiplication, and you get another vector out. And as you know, n by n matrices, square matrices, have that property. I can multiply two square matrices, what I get out is another square matrix. And so I can, and, and, and all of a sudden you have a, so the matrices form a vector space. And all of a sudden, you, in addition to the summation of matrices, you can have a product of matrices. So you have yet another way to combine two matrices and get the matrix out. And that structure that you have then is obviously more than just a vector space because we have, in addition to the summation that does that, we also have the matrix product that also takes two matrices and generates another matrix. And that additional structure that we have with matrices compared to, say, R3, this is what uh, gives rise to the term ring. That's what we call a ring. I mentioned groups. Once you have matrices, there exist particular groups of matrices. Because once you can multiply matrices, the first question that you may all have in your mind is, can I compute, uh, do I have inverses with respect to m matrix multiplication? And in practice, in general, you don't. So f you, cannot, uh, you cannot always invert the product of a matrix. But sometimes you can, and then you have group structures. So then you have uh, a group structure where you have a neutral element and an inverse element. The neutral element in the set of matrices is, of course, the unit matrix. But just to recap a little bit, uh, a group 
is a set G that has an, uh, some operation, concatenation, maybe the matrix multiplication, if you like. And the, the properties are that if you concatenate two elements, you remain in the group. So that's called closedness of, the, of your set with respect to that um, concatenation. Then you have associativity, that is G1 times G2, and, and that then concatenated with G3 is the same if I take G2 and G3, concatenate them, and then concatenate them with G1. If that holds, then it's associative. And then you have a neutral element uh, that doesn't affect any element. So for any element, uh, uh, there exists a neutral element such that concatenating it with the other elements doesn't change them. The unit matrix, for example. If you multiply any matrix with a unit matrix, it stays the same. And then you have an inverse in a group that is for any element G, I have some inverse. And if I multiply it, then I get the unit element. In fact, if you look into, into linear algebra classes, you find a, a sub distinction between a left inverse and a right inverse. In principle, these are two different things, but, but here we say they, uh, we have a, this is called a right inverse if multiplying from the right, and this is called a left inverse. Yes? Here, yes, you're right. So that should be a G, E times G, G times E should be G, not E. That's a good point. Yeah, I have to correct. So here you should have a G. All invertible matrices, to give you a concrete example, n by n matrices, uh, if they're invertible, they're called non-singular. Singular means it's not invertible. All invertible square matrices, they form a group with respect to matrix multiplication. Why? Well, by construction. By saying they're invertible, I, I say they should all have an inverse. And if I only take those that have an inverse, um, then you can easily see if you take the product of two matrices that have an inverse, that product also has an inverse. And so they form a group. They're closed. And this group is called the general linear group. So that are the linear transformations, i.e. square matrices here, which are invertible. And you can imagine among possible matrix groups, there's actually a lot of possible matrix groups. We'll see now the general linear group is the largest because any group has to have inverses, and this is the set of all matrices that have an inverse, and so that set is the largest possible matrix group. That's maybe maybe that that may be the reason why it's called general linear. General sounds a bit bombastic, I find. Anyway, that's the general linear group. Uh, in practice, you can check if a matrix is invertible by looking at its determinant. So if you have a square matrix and the determinant is non-zero, then it's invertible. Why that is, we'll not go into detail here, but once you compute inverses, there is a way to compute the matrix inverse, and that exploits the fact that you have an, a non-zero determinant. Of course, among all matrices of the general linear group, I can now consider subsets, which possibly are still groups in themselves. So these would be subgroups of the general linear group. For example, the general linear group are all square matrices with non-zero determinant. Now, among these, I can look at those that have determinant 1. Why we want to do that, we'll see later. But let's look at the matrices that have determinant 1. This group is called the special linear group, SLN. N meaning n by n matrices. And S stands for special. That means the determinant is not only non-zero, but it is exactly 1. They form a group that is not actually trivial to show. What you have to show is that for showing that they are a subgroup, you have to show they're closed. Meaning if I take two matrices of determinant 1, the product of them still has determinant 1. Otherwise, it's not a, a subgroup. 
and that that is the case. Um, and the, you also have to show that the inverse to each matrix is still in that group. So for any matrix A that has determinant 1, it turns out the inverse matrix has determinant of the matrix A to the power of minus 1. So it's just the, the inverse of the determinant. And so if the determinant of A is 1, the inverse also has determinant 1, meaning it's also part of the group, and that shows you then that SLN is a subgroup of GLN. This is a little bit abstract, and I must say it's a... It's a, a, a concept that I remember I had to struggle with when I first heard it in a class. It is the idea of representing groups by matrices. The idea behind it is not so difficult, actually. The idea is that if you talk about groups, you often have a somewhat abstract representation of the group. For example, if I take my camera, let's say this is the camera, and in multi-view reconstruction you often look at cameras that move around, all possible rotations of that camera around any axis, they form a group. Why? Because if I take two rotations, say I rotate 30 degrees and I rotate yet another 30 degrees, then what I do in total is a 60 degree rotation and that's still a rotation. So concatenating rotations it gives me another rotation. So in that sense, the rotation, the set of rotations is closed under this kind of concatenation. In addition to any element, any rotation, I have an inverse rotation. I can always rotate the thing back to its original location. And so the set of rotations form a group. And you can see that they form a group, but yet I have not actually given you a concrete representation that you can write down. And you may remember from, if ever you've looked into rotations, it's not actually trivial to find the right representation for, f uh, for rotations. For example, the rotations in, in R2 can be represented by a matrix that is typically cosine theta, cosine theta, minus sine theta, and sine theta. And this is a rotation with a parameter theta, and that theta is typically in the interval from 0 to, 255, uh, to uh, 360, so 2 pi if you want. And that's a rotation matrix. Uh, and and the, once you actually work with things in a computer, for example, you want to have a concrete representation of your group. And, and, and that would be a matrix representation of the rotations in uh, the two, 2D rotations. And so this is the whole point, is that you take a group that you have some abstract notion of, and you can represent each element of the group by a specific matrix. So in the rotations in the plane, you only have one rotation angle, that characterizes all possible rotations. And once I fix that rotation angle, I have a specific matrix that represents this rotation. And that I can actually work with in a computer. And so the idea of representing groups by matrices uh, uh, is basically that for each group element, I have a representation R of G for the group element G, and that is the matrix. And I say that this representation R of G is a mapping that takes a group element, rotation around 90 degrees, to an element in the matrices, this here. And that transformation is called, uh, um, it pr it, one says it preserves the group structure, that is, if if it's compatible with the group representation, meaning the neutral element should be mapped to the neutral element in the matrices, that is the unit matrix. And in addition, the concatenation of group elements should be the same as the concatenation of matrices. So if that holds true, then the map R that maps each group element to a concrete matrix is called a group homomorphism. 
I guess the terminologies are not terribly important here. What is important is that I can associate each abstract group element with a concrete matrix representation. Because matrices are something I can work with, where I can multiply matrices. You know, if the problem is, uh, let's say I tell you I rotate around this axis 90 degrees and around another axis 20 degrees, what do I get in total as a transformation? You know, if you have to think about it in your head, you, you're not, it's going to be very difficult. But if I give you a concrete matrix representation, then you just multiply the two matrices and they, then you have your new transformation. And so there you see it's useful to be able to represent motion of the camera with concrete matrices. And that's why we have the matrix representation and basically we, we have this uh, uh, property that it preserves the group structure. And this is typically the, the most common uh, rep, um, uh, example of uh, matrix representations of groups is the, the, the rotations. But we will actually see other transformations. For example, as you know, in addition to rotating a camera, I can move the camera around. And if I then rotate and translate, this also forms a group, a larger group because I have now six degrees of freedom, three translational degrees, and three rotational degrees. And so it's a six-dimensional group, but I have a matrix representation for that. And the idea is that I can study groups by studying matrices. Because matrices are concrete, I can write them down, I can multiply, I can implement them in a computer. Some groups, just that you've heard the names, you've seen the general linear group that is all invertible, yes? That's a good point. So let me ask the question. Uh, we can stop here. Usually Thursday is only one, one hour. But the thing is, I noticed actually the last weeks, we, the, we had a lot of holidays last week. For example, yesterday was a holiday. I think next week is yet another holiday. My suggestion would be to do two hours now to make up a little bit for the, for the missed time. If that's fine with you, unless you know if you want... Uh, let's do it this way. I, I think this is the best. Maybe I'll do two hours today and, and whoever wants to leave now you know, if you have other appointments that you have to attend, right? I don't know how good the quality is. You'll see that I, uh, this is my first recording, so I can tell you later if it worked or not. Yeah. Or let's, let's have a vote. I mean, who, who prefers stopping now and, and then we continue next week? No. Okay, I, I'll, I'll continue then. Um, so, uh, about groups, there are uh, the general linear group is the largest group, the special linear are the ones with determinant one, and now I wanted to show you a number of other groups, mainly to show you what kinds of groups there are in the matrices. For example, I mentioned cameras can be rotated and translated. Adding a vector B is a translation. Multiplying with a vector a matrix A uh, in some cases can be a rotation, but it, typically it's more general. And so this, is, this transformation of a vector X is called an affine transformation. And what it does, given a vector x, it creates a new vector shifted by a b and, and a, you mul multiply, uh, multiplied by a matrix A and shifted by b. And the matrix A has to be an invertible matrix because I want to be able to invert the transformation. If A was not invertible, then the whole transformation would not be invertible. The group of these transformations A is called the affine group of dimension n. In an n by n in an n-dimensional vector space is called a n. This transformation L is not a linear transformation, mind you, unless b equals zero. 
So we saw what linearity means. If you, if you take two vectors, x and y, and transform the sum of them, then you, you get two b's. One, uh, so, so then you, don't, you see that this is not a linear transformation. But we can actually convert it to something linear by expanding the dimension. And this is going to be done frequently later on in the class. What you do is you just take the vector x and append a 1 to that vector. And this is called x in homogeneous coordinates. So this is a, the homogeneous coordinates for a vector x. And then if I write this transformation in that representation, then I can write it like this. AB01 times x1. What that does is you can see it. If I multiply this matrix with this vector, I get AX plus B in the, in the first uh, uh, part and 1 in the second part. And so all of a sudden, this affine transformation by increasing the dimension of my representation by using so-called homogeneous coordinates, it becomes a linear transformation. One that I can represent with a matrix. A single matrix action can represent this transformation. So this nonlinear transformation in Rn can be encoded as a linear transformation in Rn plus 1. This is a trick. Why is that trick useful? Because later on we will deal with transformations like that. We will have translations of the camera, and that is just plus some translation, but we still want to use linear algebra techniques. We want to use matrices, and so here we just have a trick to get around this issue by expanding to homogeneous coordinates we have a linear representation. We can encode that general affine transformation by some matrix that has this, this shape. This matrix is then called an affine matrix this particular matrix, and it is an invertible matrix. If A is invertible, one can easily show that this whole matrix is also invertible. Um, um, I, I wrote Y here. I recommend that you think about it at home. It's actually not so difficult to even construct the inverse. If you assume that A is invertible, you can easily construct the inverse to that matrix as well. And so that group of affine matrices is a subgroup of the n plus 1 linear group, the general linear group. They form a subgroup. I said, why do they form a subgroup? The first thing that you have to show is that they are invertible. But that's not difficult. If A is invertible, one can easily show that the whole matrix is also invertible. And the second thing that you have to show to show that they form a subgroup is that they're closed. So if I take two matrices with A, B, the first one, and say A prime, B prime, the second one, and then I multiply these two matrices, then you can see you get another matrix of this form. So A, B, 1, 0 times a prime b prime one zero gives you a matrix let's call it c and d zero one with an invertible matrix c and some vector d that's not so difficult to show that these matrices preserve their structure and in that sense they are closed meaning if i take two such matrices the product gives me another such matrix and therefore this affine transformations, these affine matrices, they form a subgroup of GLN plus 1. They're invertible and they are closed under matrix multiplication. Another group that we will see are, is the orthogonal group. Uh, uh, the orthogonal group, there are many ways to introduce that group, but the way we want to introduce it here is we want to say the group the matrix A is, is called orthogonal if it preserves the inner product. That means if I take two vectors x and y, uh, 
and look at their scalar product. And then I transform both vectors with the matrix A, then the scalar product of the transformed is the same as the scalar product of the original. What, as you may remember, scalar products are related to angles for vectors. The scalar product tells me something about the angle. A transformation is called orthogonal if it preserves the angles between vectors. This set of orthogonal matrices, they form a group, and it's called the orthogonal group. And it's a subgroup of GLN. Why is that? It's not so difficult to see. If one matrix preserves the angles, then multiplying two matrices has, you know, it still preserves the angles. It, so the scalar products are preserved. And, uh, and for any matrix that preserves the angles, you have uh, uh, the, this that preserves the inner product, you have an inverse that also preserves the inner product. In particular, for an orthogonal matrix, we know R, let's call R the orthogonal matrix, Rx, Ry should be the same as X times Y. If I write that scalar product out, I get X transpose R transpose R, Y should be X transpose Y. And therefore, we can conclude if this holds true for any X and Y, this can only be true if R transpose R is the unit matrix. Because this product is the same as this product for any X and Y, and that means the matrix in between has to be a unit matrix. If it wasn't a unit matrix, you would find an X such that this is violated. And so we can conclude that for orthogonal matrices, we get R transpose R is R, R transpose is the unit matrix. Here, the I again means the unit matrix. And in fact, often in the literature, this is how people introduce orthogonal matrices. If you maybe recall, maybe you've heard about orthogonal matrices before, typically they say orthogonal matrices are matrices which are invertible, so the general linear group, and for which R transpose R is the unit matrix. The problem with that, for me, is I don't see the intuition behind defining a thing like that. This is often in math that there is a level of abstraction where it sometimes even seems the author didn't want you to get the intuition behind it. So if you say R transpose R must be unit matrix, to me that, at least at a first glance, doesn't mean anything. Whereas here, preserving the inner product, preserving the angles between vectors is a somewhat more intuitive um, explanation. What's actually interesting about the orthogonal matrices is we said the general linear group are matrices where the determinant is non-zero. For orthogonal matrices, it's fairly easy to compute what the determinants are. It's actually only two cases of orthogonal matrices in terms of their determinant. Namely, if you have R transpose R and you compute the determinant, one can show in general that the determinant of R transpose R is the same as determinant of R squared. And now I was saying R transpose R is the unit matrix. So that must be the same as the determinant of the unit matrix. And the unit matrix has determinant 1. Which means from the property that R transpose R is the unit matrix, I can deduce that the determinant of R squared is 1. Meaning it can only be 1 or minus 1. There's only two possible cases. Once you have an orthogonal matrix, you know the determinant must be either plus 1 or minus 1. Once you take those orthogonal matrices with determinant plus 1, they form what's called the special orthogonal group, S-O-N. We saw that before, imposing the determinant to be 1 is what we had with the special linear group that was determinant 1. Here, if we take among all orthogonal 
matrices those with determinant plus one and leave out the ones with determinant minus one, we get a subgroup and that's called the special orthogonal group. And these are actually the rotation matrices. So orthogonal transformations, and that's the, something that should be intuitive to most people. If I take vectors and I rotate them, the angle stays the same. If I transform them with some arbitrary linear transformation in matrix, I'm not assured that the angle state is preserved. But if it's a rotation, then the angles are preserved. So this is something that you know from everyday life. Uh, and this, this group is called special orthogonal group. SO3 are the rotations in 3D. Here a question to see if you're paying attention. I took among all orthogonal uh, matrices the ones with determinant plus one. And I said they form a subgroup called the special orthogonal group. How about the ones with determinant minus one? Do they also form a group? No, why not? Exactly. So that's the point. For example, let's take a matrix of the form 1 minus 1. That's a very simple matrix with determinant minus 1. But if I take two such matrices, then I get the product is a matrix with determinant plus 1. And so I'm no longer in the same group. Meaning the set of matrices with determinant minus 1 is not closed. As you say, once I multiply 2 with determinant minus 1, the determinant changes. And so I don't have a closed set, and then I don't have a subgroup. And this is why only the ones with plus 1 make sense to consider as a subgroup. Anyone have an idea what the orthogonal transformations with determinant minus 1, what they might mean in the real world? Yes, exactly. So a mirroring, for example. What this transformation does, the one with the uh, uh, minus one here, it just flips one of the axes. And this is called mirroring, and um, it's not a rotation. And so actually, in general, all orthogonal transformations are usually uh, 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 rotations and, and mirroring. That's what I have there. Now we come to the Euclidean group, and that is among, we saw the affine group was, I call it AX plus B. The Euclidean group is a subset of these, namely those where R is a rotation. So for any vector X, I consider I rotate the vector and I translate it. Not just rotation, but any orthogonal transformation. So mirroring is still in, in that set here. This is called the Euclidean group. And I can again represent it with a matrix representation, just like for the affine group. I can expand in homogeneous coordinates. And then the elements can be represented in this way. Um, an orthogonal matrix R, a vector T, and 0, 1. And among these, I can consider those, again, where the determinant is exactly 1. That means I take a matrix R that is not just orthogonal, but has determinant 1. That is then a rotation. And this group is then called the special Euclidean group. And that group is a very important group for what we do, because it's also called, it's also called the rigid body motions. This transformation with special Euclidean groups, so a rotation and a translation, that's what you can do with a camera. That's essentially all you can do with your camera, unless you change the focal settings and the zoom, etc. But if you assume all the settings of the camera are fixed, and all you can do is move around in space, then what the camera does at any given point is a rigid body motion. A rotation and a translation, nothing more. In German, the rigid body motions are called Starkörpertransformation, just 
Some uh, the classes in English, but for those interested, I sometimes put the German terminology for completeness. Sometimes useful. Often I find the difficulty with teaching in English is that students learn the English terminology and in the end they don't even know what the stuff is called in German, and that's a bit unfortunate. And so, for completeness, I sometimes give the German words, and as you can see, typical for the German language, very long words. This one is a, an example. So, to summarize now what the groups that we've seen so far, the matrix groups, the largest group we've seen is the general linear group that are all invertible matrices. A subset of these are the ones where R transpose R is 1, that are the so-called orthogonal matrices, mirroring and rotations, and those with determinant plus 1, so we saw orthogonal matrices have determinant either plus 1 or minus 1, those with determinant plus 1 form the so-called special orthogonal group, the rotations. Similarly, in these homogeneous coordinates, we have the, 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 the most general group is the general linear group, the invertible n plus 1 times n plus 1 matrices. Among these, we, can have, we have a subgroup called the affine matrices, where we have an arbitrary invertible matrix here, uh, some, trans some translation T and the 1. Among these, again, we can consider the Euclidean group, that is the ones where this matrix is orthogonal. And among these, yet another subgroup is the special Euclidean group, and these are the rigid body transformations. Of course, in the set space of matrices, you can consider other groups. These are the most common groups. There are other groups that you can easily construct. For example, if I just take R2 and I consider the rotations, if I allow only three rotation angles, namely zero degrees, and then uh, um, only, let's say, I allow angles only, theta only, say, zero, uh, pi over two, pi and uh, 3 pi over 2, then I have rotations around very fixed angles, they also form a group. Because if I only rotate around certain degrees and concatenate them, then I, s I stay in that subset. But these are not so interesting because they're finite groups. They're groups that only have three or four elements. And so these are the most common groups among those that have infinitely many elements. Matrices. A little more about matrices. I just realized, and I apologize, the slides are a bit full, as you can see, but it's, it's just to, to put everything, uh, like to, to, to kind of compactly summarize properties of matrices uh, here. A little more about matrices. Um, let's say we have a matrix M by N, so not necessarily square. This is actually important. Some of the things we discuss are about square matrices. Some are about non-square. Like the previous slide, all these matrices are all square matrices. But in general, you know, matrices can be rectangular, so not necessarily square. And then we can define what's called the range of a matrix A. Sometimes it's also called the span. It basically means all, if you consider the columns of the matrix as vectors, the elements that you can, that you can reach with that matrix. So here, the range of A are all elements Y in the, in the vector space Rm, such that there exists an X that is mapped to Y. So I consider the matrix as a transformation from one vector space to another, and I ask which vectors can I reach in the new space. To give you a concrete example, if I take the square matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, the range of that are vectors y1, 0. That is the range with y1 in R. That is the range of this matrix. 
Why? Because if I take any vector x and multiply with a, then the second component is immediately killed. And so all that I can reach ever are the ones that, uh, where, this, where the second component is zero. And so that would be the range. So nothing very profound, but it's useful to have a term to, to denote what are the space, what is the space of vectors that I can reach with this multiplication. And indeed, I mentioned it, uh, the range of a matrix A is given by the span of its column vectors. Then I can define the null space or the kernel that is in some sense complementary to the range. It is that set of vectors in the original space which are mapped to zero. For example, for this matrix here, the kernel of that matrix A are the vectors which are 0, x2, with x2 in R. I said what this matrix does, it kills the second component, and so all vectors that only have a second component are immediately mapped to 0. And in that sense, you see, in some sense, range and kernel of a matrix in this example, they are complementary. And in fact, you can characterize that complementarity more precisely. In MATLAB, it's easy to actually compute the range of a matrix. This so-called, the, the kernel of a matrix is called a null space as well, just null of A. So if you have any matrix A, null of A gives you um, the null space. Specifically, of course, it doesn't give you all vectors in the null space because there are infinitely many in general, but it gives you a basis of that null space. So if you apply MATLAB in this case and you say null of A, what it will give you is the vector 0, 1. That, that is the basis of the null space. Um, the concepts of range and null space are useful when you study linear equation systems. And this is something that is done frequently in science, that you have to solve linear equation systems and often you want to characterize the set of possible solutions. And as you recall from high school even, uh, once you have a linear equation system, there are three cases. Either you have no solution, or you have a unique solution, or you have infinitely many solutions. And which of these three cases is, is, uh, we currently have depends on range and on, on the null space. So let's say the equation system is AX equals B. That's how it usually was in high school, I remember. Uh, um, there is a solution if and only if B is in the range of A. That's a trivial statement, right? <laughs> it's almost a tautology. I mean, the range is defined as those vectors that you can reach. If you cannot reach that vector, well, then there is no solution to the equation system. So if you know what the range of, of A is, then you can basically check, is that vector B in the range of A? If yes, then I have a solution. If no, I have no solutions. Then you want to know, okay, let's assume I have a solution. Is there just one solution or are there many? Then you look at the kernel of A. If the kernel of A is only the zero vector, then I'm going to have a unique solution. But if the kernel is not just zero, but uh, something more, say some vector x0 is in the kernel and say xs is a solution, then xs plus x0 will also be a solution. Why? Because any element that is in the kernel, once you apply the matrix A to this, it will be mapped to 0 by definition. And so A times xs plus x0 is axs plus ax0. And if x0 is in the kernel, then this is the same as axs. And so you have another solution. So as soon as your null space of the matrix is not just the zero vector, but some typically one-dimensional or higher-dimensional subspace, then, um, then you get infinitely many solutions. So, for example, with this matrix, you know, if I find a solution to some equation system AX plus B, 
a x equals b sorry then um, then if I add elements to the second component a doesn't care they're mapped to zero anyway and so that doesn't affect uh, the, the solutions And so there, you easily see that range and null space are useful to characterize solutions of linear equation systems. The range can directly tell you, is there a solution, yes or no? And the null space can then tell you, if there is a solution, is it just one or are there infinitely many? And so, studying the null space and the range of a matrix tells you pretty much everything about solvability of linear equation systems. Once you have um, a matrix A, you can define what's called the rank of a matrix. The rank of the matrix is nothing but the dimension of the range. So, for example, in this, in this case, the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0 is a matrix of rank 1. Why? Because the space of vectors I can reach is a one-dimensional space. And I, t I mentioned earlier that uh, range and kernel are complementary uh, in, in the sense that, for example, here, the range is uh, all vectors with y1 and 0, and the kernel of that matrix is 0x, so it's complementary. And you can actually characterize that in general, not just for this example, but you can show that the rank of a matrix A, the dimension of the range, is the total dimension of space n minus the dimension of the null space. In other words, the dimension of the range plus the dimension of the null space are always the full space. That's what we have here. The kernel is one-dimensional, the range is one-dimensional, the sum of them is two. And that holds for any two-by-two two matrix. It's not actually surprising that that is the case. Basically, it means if there are vectors here that cannot be reached, it is because there is some subset of vectors that is mapped to zero. And so the range is not the full space if the kernel is, is non-trivial, meaning if the kernel has not just the zero but some relevant subset of vectors that is mapped to zero, that implies that you will not be able to reach all vectors in, your, in, in the range. So that's that is this property again. I will not show these properties. Some of them are easy to show. Some of them are more, a little more involved. I just wanted to mention what, what properties we have. For example, if you have a non-square m by n matrix, the rank is always non-negative, of course because it's the dimension of some space, it can't be negative. And in addition, it is smaller or equal to the minimum of m by n. So if, if I have a 3 by 2 matrix, then the rank is at most 2. cannot be more than 2. So it, the rank is, is constrained by m and n. Another thing you can show is that the rank is equal to the maximum number of linearly independent rows or columns uh, of A. So that gives you a way to actually compute the rank. Here we said how many columns are there. There is the column 1, 0 and 0, 0. And there is only one linearly independent vector, obviously. The 1, 0 and the other one is, is, is linearly dependent. Uh, uh, so you clearly have rank 1. And similarly, if you have a, a matrix, say, of the type 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, 3, 0, that matrix, for example, has rank 2, obviously, because this vector is linearly independent, this one as well, but this one is not. And so, so you can sometimes read off the rank easily, Sometimes with complicated matrices, it's not so easy to read off the rank, but, um, um, but once you compute how many linearly independent rows or columns the matrix has, then you have the rank. 
this may be not so important. The rank is the highest order of a non-zero non minor of A, where a minor of order K is the determinant of a K by K submatrix. That is very abstract, I admit. What it basically means is you take a matrix and you kill certain rows and columns to get to some K by K submatrix, and then you check what is the rank of that submatrix. And if you do that for all possible K by K submatrices, uh, um, um, then you get the rank of the whole matrix. Why that is, I'm not going to go into detail, but what you see is there's a lot of interesting kind of ways to, to represent or to compute the rank of a matrix. We uh, don't have to worry about how to compute the rank of a matrix because MATLAB does that. You give it a matrix, it can tell you the rank. Um, and here's the command, rank A gives you the rank of the matrix. Maybe one, uh, two more uh, properties of, uh, of rank. There is an inequality that says if you have two matrices A and B as, uh, in M by N mate, M by K matrices, then the rank of A plus the rank of B minus the, uh, the dimension of your space uh, of a, a N, so B, sorry, B is N by K, is small or equal to the rank of the product. And the rank of the product, in turn, is smaller than the smallest rank of either one. This is an Im important, actually, property that we will use later. Uh, it basically means that if you have two matrices that have a certain rank, A and B, you can say something about the product of these two matrices. Meaning, if I have a, rank, a matrix with rank 1, and I, I multiply it with some matrix that has higher rank, still the product has at most rank 1, because the rank of the product is at most as large as the rank of either of these. And we will use that later on in the multi-view setting these properties of rank, because what you can do is you can uh, often represent solutions by matrices, and sometimes you don't know what the matrix is, but you know that the rank is, is at most such and such. And lastly, <coughs> if we have a, an invertible matrix C, then it doesn't actually affect the rank. So if we have two invertible matrices C and D, then the rank of matrix A is the same as the rank of CAD. So if I have matrices that are invertible and I multiply them uh, to a given matrix A, that does not affect the rank. It does not reduce the rank. So I think we'll stop here and we'll continue then uh, next week. Thank you. <coughs>